Good afternoon, everybody. Professor Balram Bhargo, Director General, Indian Council of Medical Research and Secretary DHR. Dr. Renu Saroop, Secretary Department of Biotechnology. My friend, Dr. Satish, Mr. Satish Reddy, Chairman, Dr. Reddy's Lab. Dr. Tahim Ahmed, Executive Director, International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh. Dr. Farhat Mantu, Director General, Medicine San Francisco. And Dr. Harish Payar, Deputy Director, BMGF. Dignitaries, my several colleagues and friends. I, on behalf of uh, Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, which is popularly called as DNDI, welcome you all to this important panel discussion today. Neglected topical disease in South Asia, drug discovery, development and access and challenges and opportunity is the title of this, uh, the scope of this panel discussion. During this panel discussion, I will also like to take this opportunity of your presence and the presence of all the dignitaries to unveil the strategic plan of DNDI for next eight years. And after this, Dr. Kavita Singh, who is executive director, will be presenting that. The NDI is an international non-profit organization, as all of us know. And the objective of this is to discover, develop, deliver, safe, effective, and affordable treatment for neglected diseases. DNDI primarily derives its strengths from innovation, from open science, from partnership, and from advocacy to find solution to treat life-threatening diseases that disproportionately impact poor and marginalized people. And that is what is our strength, the strength of DNDI. This organization, DNDI, was founded in 2003. And Professor Balram Bhargo is here. This was beginning was housed in Indian Council of Medical Research, which Dr. Bhargo often emphasizes that. So ICMR has been the key pillar from the beginning and it has been guiding the priorities and the activities of DNDI throughout this region. DNDI today, over the years, has increased its domain, its canvas, and it has now network of 200 partners across the globe. So now the activity has grown up. The India office is primarily to ensure collaboration with Bangladesh, Nepal and Sri Lanka. And we have one of the speakers from Bangladesh as well today. The NDA in the region has been working in the field of primarily in Kalajar and malaria and in conducting clinical trials. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all partners across the globe, particularly in this region and in India particularly, who have been partner in developing clinical trial and generating the, the policy papers. And we thank all those who have been associated for this endeavor. One of the key achievement of DNDI, I say to say, in South Asia has been the development of a new strategy for treatment of visceral dysmaniasis. And we know that the pentamidine or stigogluconate that were the treatment once upon a time, cumbersome treatment. And then we entered into the new treatment regime. 
and the findings of the clinical trial where the DNDI was also partner was perhaps one of the important factor in policy change. That is a success story. The journey in the visceral leishmanesis continues and we are looking for still safe, better, effective, and more importantly, the oral solution for that. And we have a molecule for that. And I'm sure that the considering the requirement, considering the clinical research infrastructure and considering the support from all, this will be a success story. South Asia, if I say, Southeast Asia, bears the maximum burden of neglected disease. And just to name a few, and both ICMR, Department of Biotechnology, both are working on these areas differentially. Lymphatic filariasis, dengue, very challenging. Snake bite, still unsolved problem. And trachoma, as though it, trachoma is much less, but it's still there. And we are together, we are trying to find out an effective solution for larger population. Based on the R&D activities and based on the R&D capacity in India for which the network solution is being developed by intensive effort of ICMR, Dr. Balram Bhargo and also Dr. Irin Surup, and uh, coupled with the global public need, we think that this is the real opportunity to develop a strong and meaningful working partnership with the DNDI, with ICMR, and with the DBT, and also pharmaceutical industry, and also the support of a regulator to make it a fast track, to make the effective intervention available to the masses in a very short time. I'm sure that this so learned panel which we have will address the challenges and will also provide this possible solution and will also give the direction for DNDI for addressing neglected disease issue, drug discovery, development, and making accessible or access of these drugs. I'm sure that the outcome of this deliberation, which is being recorded, will act as a guidance document for years to come. I look forward for a very fruitful panel discussion. And I am again, I thank to all the dignitaries here. I am not going to repeat, but each and every person here is so critical, so important for the document to be created, which will act as a roadmap and future uh, working guidance. And I look forward for continued support and collaboration with the DNDI. Thank you very much. And I wish this two hour panel, one and a half hour panel discussion to be very interactive and very useful. Thank you very much to everybody again. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, getting this platform to share the strategic plan of DNDI with special focus for our region to this esteemed panel and large audience is a deep desire fulfilled. Can I have the next slide, please, Ramin? While I do recognize uh, there are many old friends, but we're also hoping that we have make new friends today and they may want to know a little more about our past so as to be connecting with our strategic plan for the coming years. Uh, next slide, please. Already explained by Professor Gupta that this organization was created in 2003 more as a response to the frustrations of clinicians and even the desperation of patients because of ineffective, unavailable, or even at times not even developed drugs. And the root cause of this problem, which you would see mentioned below, is the prevailing profit-oriented model for R&D, which practically leaves very little incentive to develop drugs for neglected population. But I'm sure you, everyone would also appreciate that this common vision to explore new alternative models for R&D uh, resounded well with many key partners, as you would see right from ICMR, from within the country, 
from Kenya participation, Malaysia participation, Oswaldo Cruz in Brazil. And of course, with the great support of WHO Special Program on Research and Training, which teamed up with MSF. Next, please. So nearly two decades later, when we look at our R&D portfolio, if you see the leftmost column is where the diseases are mentioned and the topmost row is where how very characteristically any pharma company would, uh, would showcase, in fact, its portfolio. It is extremely satisfying. Uh, in the early years, DNDI has focused mainly on de uh, developing improved treatments or combination of treatments, which can be appreciated in the last column of implementation. And understanding, uh, but while these uh, treatments were being tested for existing tools, the portfolio was gradually getting populated with more uh, candidates. And understanding the high attrition and failure rates during development, you would, everyone would appreciate the portfolio approach for backups. Uh, next slide, please. And to take example of one of the portfolio, which Professor Gupta did allude to very, very clearly, uh, and it was it also shows the commitment and years of uh, working on ground was with BL in India and South Asia. While it, you know, not many decades back, India was an epicenter of Kalazar with more than fifty percent of the reported cases being. Uh, being demonstrated by this disease, which is spread by sand flies and can lead to death if not treated. And as the, it got further complicated with a lot of resistance coming up, and I'll not repeat much of what Professor Gupta said, but certainly like to highlight that the deep partnership between the regional countries allowed many collaborative studies to be done, which helped in, you know, which helped the region, South Asia region, to have a single, a first option, single dose amphotericin B and a combination is second option. And today when our case numbers in India has, are extremely encouraging, which have fallen from 3,000 to 70,000, uh, it's a very happy moment, I'm sure, for all of us. But we at DNDI are continuing to work because we still feel our work is not completed. And uh, our goal is to deliver new short courses, oral treatment for all types of leishmaniasis, which are ultimately easier to handle at the primary healthcare center and because of the challenge of parenteral antibiotic, uh, uh, amphotericin. Next one, please. The continuous engagement for the last 15 years have allowed DNDI to deliver nine treatments and build a robust pipeline of about 20 plus new chemical entities. And it would be extremely uh, gratifying to see 13 projects in phase three and registration. With a small team of DNDI has of about 200 plus, 250 plus people, an average of 20 clinical studies are done each year. And a knowledge or a share, our strengths of clinical research network is something we would be so happy to share as a knowledge. This was also demonstrated with this quick establishment of COVID-19 research coalition with more than 350 members. And our two, uh, Professor Gupta also mentioned that we have about more than 200 partners in 40 countries. Another uh, um, movement of pride is the develop is the establishment of a not-for-profit organization along with WHO, which so practically DNDI incubated another not-for-profit, the Global Antibiotic R&D Partnership, or also very well known as GARPI. And in 2016, it actually became an independent organization. Uh, and even I, they also have a sign-up MOU with ICMR and they were developing treatments for drug resistance infection especially in the areas of uh, sexually transmitted infections, sepsis in newborns and infections in hospitalized adults and children. We believe that this is a right time to share this model of years of evaluation of affordable drug development. And today is one such attempt of sharing. And have the next one, please. With so much ground covered, it is also a moment for DNDI to reflect along with its partner what the forward journey would look like. And at this moment, I again uh, thank all the stakeholders who in the last one year have repeatedly engaged with us to, uh, to get, show us some guidance forward and to help us articulate our path for the next eight years. We take cognizance of the fact that there are still systemic needs as there is neglect to invest in unprofitable or challenging segments, which include, of course, our entities. It also includes the availability of pediatric formulations, uh, we also see, always see lack of gender responsive R&D and also uh, which extends to an equitable access worldwide. So there's a neglect we see in all these areas. And as we face the coming decade, we all know that we must brace ourselves for an ever increasing needs. 
as a result for future pand pandemics. Uh, back time to talk about pandemics. The silent crisis of I uh, AMR, climate sensitive disease, and of course, the long standing endemic and neglected diseases. May I have the next slide, please? Therefore, our partners and we all agreed that our work is more urgent than ever, and it is important to establish strategic imperatives to guide our road forward. And the five main strategic imperatives are what we have listed here, is that to address R&D needs for entities, viral disease, pandemic prone and climate sensitive, we need to advance sustainable innovation closer to the disease of interest, need to contribute to maternal and child health, need to conduct R&D not behind closed doors because it certainly reduces efficiency, but we need to promote open collaboration and knowledge sharing to ensure value for public investment, accelerate science for this, for this specific, you know, this neglected population and diseases. Finally, I don't think it's a time to stay away or shy away from new technologies, even if you're working on neglected diseases to accelerate both R&D and access. And I would not go down deep into the, uh, um, new technologies, but certainly uh, using AI approach to accelerate or shortcut drug discovery using newer platforms like MAPS and oligonucleotides or using pathways like target-based screening and structure-based design are some technologies which even this, uh, even if you're working in the area of neglected disease, we need to be very cognizant of. Go to the next slide, please. And based on these strategic imperatives, uh, DNDI, along with its partners, stakeholders, uh, we commit to deliver 15 to 18 additional treatments with 10 to 12 coming from the already current mature portfolio and five to seven from the early stage NCs as we had seen in the, early, uh, the first couple of slides. We realized that our three pillars which could make us effective uh, as a team are we need to innovate to save lives. We need to for foster inclusive, and I mentioned before, closer to the uh, you know, international networks which, are, which have the burden of this disease and also have evidence-based advocacy for change, which will certainly help in an equitable and open dialogue. And I go to the next slide, please. And with this, I would like to sh quickly share the few diseases, which of course would look like a very global platform because we are being a global organization. Every region has its own burden of disease, but within our region, certainly uh, we would like to focus on continuing to work on leishmaniasis identify and deliberate if there are uh, activities which can be done for filaria while India is embarked on mass drug administration to see and evaluate if there is any role to sterilize adult worms. And if we need to do any testings, we would certainly need to do more deeper deliberation. If we need to uh, test for treatments for mycetoma, uh, we have both in India fungal and bacterial. On the next one, please. And of the others one, uh, Professor Gupta also mentioned are hepatitis, uh, B, C, E, uh, a pandemic prone diseases, a preparation for dengue and a uh, chronically neglected viral disease, snake bite and more. Can I have the next one, please? I think I would like to conclude now, I'd like to conclude by you know, reiterating that DNDI is a virtual R&D organization. We have no labs or manufacturing facilities and we act more as a conductor for virtual orchestra to coordinate the activities of our partners and to work with our stakeholders. A virtual collaboration model harnesses the best of public, private, not profit, philanthropic, funding agencies, government agencies. And lastly, we are so hopeful that our work will contribute to achieve the sustainable development goal, the one health approach for drug disease control and elimination. We are hoping that we are able to catch up with the WHO strategy on the roadmap for the NTDs in 2030. But certainly, last but the most important one, that we get our regional priorities right. With that, I thank you for your attention and I hand over to uh, the moderator of the session, Anjali. Thank you, Dr. Kavita. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I have the privilege of moderating this very important and high level uh, discussion on challenges and opportunities of uh, neglected uh, diseases. South, I'm Anjali Nair, the Executive Vice President for Global Health Strategies. Uh, besides this, I'm also a member of the Consultative Forum for Uniting to Combat NTDs Coalition and the Confederation of Indian Industries Public Health uh, Committee. 
Uh, South Asia has a unique uh, role in combating entities globally as well as regionally, given the high disease burden and regional expertise in end-to-end -end solutions. Today's webinar uh, is really going to address some of the key challenges and also talk about the progress that's been made and how do we move from progress to success. I have the privilege of uh, introducing uh, the high level panelists and also uh, moderating the Q&A if we have some time. Before I call upon the first uh, speaker, I would just a couple of uh, house rules. For all those who want to send us some questions on Zoom, please type your questions in the Q&A panel and include your name, organization, and location. If you want uh, to address your question to a particular speaker, please do uh, put that on as well. Uh, my privilege again to introduce uh, Professor Balram Bhargav. I know uh, Professor Gupta has already mentioned his designation, but I would like to also say that uh, Professor Bhargav is one of the foremost leaders in biomedical innovation, public health, medical education, and medical research. He's also a board member of DNDI. Uh, Professor Bhargav, over to you. Thank you, Anjali, for the very, very kind words. Uh, all the dignitaries and the illuminaries uh, who have joined on uh, virtual platform, welcome to you all for this webinar. Uh, at the outset, I take the uh, opportunity to congratulate uh, DNDI for uh, unveiling its eight-year strategic plan, which is an ambitious plan of uh, targeting and uh, reaching a target of about 25 drugs once they complete 25 years in 2028. DNDI started its journey at uh, ICMR in 2003, so 20, 25 years will be completed in 2028. And we expect that 25 drugs should be available, particularly for the drugs, uh, the neglected tropical diseases and other neglected diseases, wherein we have no uh, large pharma or big pharma uh, takers, or, or it's not their business kind of a thing that uh, remain the problem. So from that perspective, I congratulate DNDI for taking this mandate, which, uh, which remains a problem of uh, much of the developing world and the global south at large. Uh, here, I would like to emphasize a few points that uh, India has been the pharmacy of the world. However, it has purely been mainly in the development of generics as well as reducing the cost of, uh, of treatments and the cost of medications. And therefore, it has uh, really captured the world market because of the quality and uh, excellent products that are being uh, supplied to different parts of the world. <laughs> Having said that, what has always remained a problem is, is the fact that India has not been a leader in new drug discovery, as well as uh, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. Much of the problem of API has been addressed during this pandemic and is being so sorted out. And we will hear the drug controller talking about that as well. Uh, but uh, the problem of uh, developing newer drugs or novel clinical entities are, uh, is uh, a challenge. Yes, they are more uh, expensive to develop new drugs. Uh, it is uh, uh, the clinical trials are expensive. The development of the drug is uh, expensive. Uh, having said that, today, India is in a unique position to foray into this territory of new drug development in a big, big way. And the commitment is there at, at all levels in the government, as well as uh, uh, institutions, as well as the pharmaceutical agencies, and I'm sure we will have uh, excellent partnership with DNDI for development of the same. An important point for any new drug di uh, discovery is the fact that there is a risk involved. And much of the de-risking of, of, of uh, the de drug development can be handled by the public sector institutions and funding agencies, which will and uh, will definitely play a major role in this development. An example of the same is the development of the COVID vaccine, the COVAXIN, wherein it was a great private-public partnership 
uh, and much of the de-risking for uh, uh, the, the, the development, much of the sophisticated animal work, animal studies, uh, and immunological studies were done at the public sector institutions with the uh, characterization of the vaccine as well as the development of the vaccine in a big way. And that is an example which I, I will, will play a major role in all uh, private, public, TNDI, et cetera, partnerships for new drug de delivery. And this example is, has been a very successful model and, and we are hoping to get the WHO pre-qualification for that vaccine very soon. Now, in terms of the, uh, the, the uh, TNDI and the ICMR um, partnership, we, uh, we are aware that the Indian Council of Medical Research has 27 institutes dedicated to several of the neglected diseases, whether it be um, uh, 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 vector control diseases or we can call malaria or leprosy or malaria. So we have dedicated institutes for, for these neglected diseases. And uh, we would be delighted to partner with DNDI in every which way on the terms and conditions which are practical and pragmatic for India and the DNDI for the rest of the world so that the cost of the drug does not, uh, does not go up. And uh, the uh, IP, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the acknowledgement for all stakeholders is equally shared. The last point I want to emphasize is that, uh, as you know, the, the, the the India is committed to elimination of separate diseases, and we have set up an institute for called uh, Desh or, um, or or Nirdesh. So that is an acronym for National Institute for Research on Disease Elimination Science and Health. And therefore, what what happens when a disease is eliminated, and to prevent its resurgence and recrudescence, we need to have the science behind it, and that is another institution which is new and being developed and will probably play a major role uh, in its partnership with DNDI when we're looking at eliminable diseases like uh, uh, leishmaniasis, visceral, uh, uh, visceral leishmaniasis, and lymphatic filariasis, etc. So with these uh, few words, I wish uh, for the unveiling of this uh, strategic plan uh, all the best, and I'm sure uh, we will uh, work together and uh, contribute to society at large and wish all the best. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Barger, for these uh, words. And we would now like to move to uh, Dr. Renu Swaroop. Uh, and again, uh, Professor Gupta has introduced, but I do know that Dr. Renu Swaroop holds an additional charge for Department of Science and Technology. She's also actively contributed to the formulation of India's uh, biotechnology vision and strategy. And of course, she's the chairperson by uh, uh, Dr. Renu Suroop, really looking forward to hearing from you. And given your focus on public-private partnerships um, and supporting high-risk projects, I wonder if your words could just touch upon a little bit on that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anjali, and uh, thank you for this introduction. Thank you, and Professor Gupta, uh, Kavita, the entire team. Thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. And uh, first of all, uh, my congratulations on this uh, very important webinar that you're doing, setting the strategy in place and getting your vision for the next few years. What better than that? It's always important. And the way that you're doing it, getting all the stakeholders and moving ahead, a strategy for an area which is so very important. And we look at drugs as clearly the area that we need to focus on, considering that India being uh, where it is, the way it's positioned, and the way India is now positioned post the COVID pandemic, when, of course, it's not post the pandemic, let's hope the pandemic goes soon, but post the pandemic, what will we really see ourselves? And there's so much of learning that's coming during this pandemic time, how we've handled this entire pandemic with s and and other interventions. 
And clearly, if you are looking at neglected diseases, the need for taking on strategies as have been positioned for the drug development make it so very important for us to have this strategy in place. DNDI's own strategy, uh, Professor Gupta and Professor Bhargav have already alluded to it in terms of what the key aspects are, the vision that you have for 25 drugs. And public-private partnership, I think, is probably the key to that success. The reason we say that is in every sector, whenever we've looked at a strategy for being able to take research from the laboratories to the end users, whether it's for societal programs, whether it's for uh, some of our commercial uh, pharma sector, or whether it's other sectors like agri, et cetera, you need all the stakeholders to come together. And COVID has actually shown us that the accelerated results which have really come out is because we had that wonderful collaboration between academia and industry and not to, of course, forget the key role that startups have played in becoming a part of it. And the drug developmental activities clearly have that as something that we should be able to move ahead. And I think DNDI itself has a mandate of working with uh, different funders, different stakeholders to be able to move this forward. Today, where we are positioned from even when probably DNDI began its journey at ICMR, I think the whole country, there has been a shift in the whole way in which we are, the, not only just the perception of public-private partnership, but also the, the ecosystem which exists today, the enabling policies which allow these collaborations to be taken forward. And, our own uh, examples that we have within the Department of Biotechnology and BIRAC have clearly shown that this model works. It's been successful. It's been successful for many, many such activities. And now, as I said, for each one of them, COVID actually became a test bed for us. And like all other challenges that we faced during COVID times, it was important for us to see how we could take our translations through this whole ecosystem that we have built. And we have been able to see success in that. Can this now be taken forward for this very important drug developmental activity? Clearly, we have seen that the pace with which we have to take forward drug development needs a special focus and a special impetus. If we could, in a short period of less than 12 months, have vaccines developed, I think it's given everyone the confidence, but more importantly, the public has got now expectations from the scientific community. That why can't you really have other products coming out at that speed? So it's, it's all about moving with a very well-defined strategy to see how we take it ahead. A couple of major missions that we have around in this area, which in fact, we've had separate discussions with the DNDI team as well. The Department of Biotechnology launched this very important biopharma mission, which was the first time that uh, we actually partnered with the World Bank for an R&D-led initiative. We always had World Bank loans coming in for large infrastructure projects, but a World Bank loan for creating a healthcare pharma infrastructure. And that mission today was really the foundation on which we took forward a lot of our COVID activities. We have AMR as one of our priority missions, which the Department of Biotechnology has launched. We have uh, activities related to the monoclonal antibodies. We have uh, snake venom, number of priorities that we've been separately looking at. But when we look at the list which DNDI has put out, there are many such which are a common priority list between what we are trying to take forward within our own strategy from what uh, DNDI is taking ahead. I think, and of course, we all look at the One Health Initiative as one of our key challenges that we'll take on. In fact, AMR itself, we feel, is a sort of a 
currently maybe silent but yes if not given sufficient attention could be our next serious concern if we don't address it we have all the tools and processes which as i said have been set in place whether it's our regulatory ecosystem and i'm sure sumani in his next uh, talk is going to let you know how the country's ecosystem is now um, geared up to take on these accelerated developmental pathways but also be the global best we have now started within dbt the working group has been constituted the biosimilar guidelines are being revisited and professor yk gupta himself is the chair of that uh, group which is looking at it our intellectual property we have a good understanding of how ip is managed between public private sector so i think plus the ecosystem as i said taking the startups through these uh, research partnerships to be able to move ahead we have our incubation centers many of the incubation centers are focused on this sort of an activity today our ecosystem provides us more than 60 such incubation centers seven clusters these incubation centers have been put into and each of these clusters has a technology transfer office which allows the understanding of what technologies need to move ahead the next step that we've gone forward is dbt has now launched the urjit clusters urjit is university research joint industry translation cluster where we see industry being co-located with the research institutes university and startups to allow co-developmental activities and what better than some of these priorities to be taken up as the first priority in these urjit clusters so all that i'm trying to sort of position here is that in this larger strategy which we and they are is working on we are very well positioned today with the best of policies with the best of instruments that allow us to take this forward and most importantly the trust that we have been able to build between academia industry and startups that is really the most important for us to move it's all about the mind accepting collaborations policies on one side and enabling ecosystem on one side but more importantly human behavior to take it ahead i'm sure bndi working with all of us here with dbt with irac with the whole team that you have along with other stakeholders uh, will be able to take this forward we'll be more than happy to see how these collaborations can move but yes public private partnership for drug development is the next biggest priority that the country needs to focus on so thank you very much anjali for giving me this uh, chance thank you so much uh, i think both uh, professor bhargav and you have completely changed the ecosystem and then we will take um, short remarks from dr vg somani the drug controller general of india and then i would like to just change the format a little bit and ask uh, professor bhargav and you a couple of questions if that's okay um so uh dr vg somani uh welcome and really everyone is looking forward uh, to hearing your remarks great interest uh, so over to you sir dr vg somani uh, ma'am i think dr vg somani actually right now uh, he has joined another important meeting right now okay uh, all right yeah thank you so much uh, so um i think we will uh, we will go back to ask uh, dr renu swaroop and professor bhargav a couple of questions i think uh, the amazing ecosystem that's been set up for research and development i mean one of the things is uh, professor bhargav how can we integrate uh, academic institutions industries and regulators to come on one common platform to focus on uh, drug and neglected diseases because it's so important it's also there doesn't seem to be enough market push so um so if you can comment a little bit on that given that icmr has this huge ecosystem of 27 institutes i think that's a important point that you're saying that uh, we are going to work on drugs which are not going to have tremendous market potential that is already the bottom line which you need to understand what we need to work on diseases which uh, on these drugs which no one else would do and particularly the big uh, big uh, pharma will, will will not work on it because it's not their problem it is our problem and we will have to work on it and 
And from that perspective, I think it's the DNDI and the India, India should take a lead, particularly for the Global South, to develop drugs and private-public partnership is encouraged. And I have already mentioned that much of the de-risking will be done by the public sector uh, for, for uh, development of these drugs. And, and the government is committed to develop new drugs, new, uh, new uh, chemical entities, particularly for these neglected diseases. And there are certain other areas which are also priority areas, uh, which are uh, <coughs> AMR and other issues. But uh, 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 and uh, with the, the ICMR uh, and the D Department of Health Research, we, are, we will be delighted to participate in that, as well as we have a large uh, a clinical trial network, which is called Intent, which is also uh, responsible for various clinical trials. And obviously, they will be frugal, low-cost clinical trials, which is which will uh, fast track. Uh, and we have a classic example, as I mentioned, of Covaxin that was developed with a private public partnership in record time. Uh, and and the, much of the clinical trials also were done in record time, whether it be the Placid trial or the Solidarity, wherein uh, we were clearly able to lead and show India's prowess in the entire world. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Bhargav. Absolutely, Covaxin is an amazing example. Dr. Swarup, you've, um, BIRAC has done um, a lot of work to pr promote research and innovation, um, particularly with the focus on startups and SMEs. Uh, what are the other ways that we can incentivize NTD drug discovery and development in India? The country has, uh, as you know, tremendous capability to do that. Do you think it could be a consortium approach or do you think uh, it should be public funded or do you think there should be other incentives? So Anjali, it has to be a mix of different models when you take it forward. As I said, uh, primarily the whole uh, basis is how do you bring these partners together? So you need to bring in all the players, whether it's the academic institutes, the startups, and of course the industry, because no consortium can move ahead till you have the industry there, because they are the ones who are going to take it forward anyway. The funders, it will have to be again a mix. As uh, Professor Bhargav just said, if you're looking at neglected drugs, there obviously is no commercial market to it. So there will have to be a lot of publicly driven uh, sort of research. But again, when you talk about public, say, there, is, there is probably in the whole developmental phase, you have to see how you do that. Most of these programs that we have also done, the government has to come in initially. One is to create an ecosystem which allows startups um, the in academia and the industry to be able to collaborate because there's a lot of investment that goes into that may not be a drug specific investment but that's an ecosystem investment which is obviously uh, you know whether it's the shared facilities that we have created with the biopharma mission or these incubation centers where our startups have given access to these shared resources or even these clusters that we are setting up within our own national laboratories and of course, now with um, COVID, when I mean, we set up the whole vaccine network, whether it's our animal challenge facilities or it's our uh, immunoassay labs or it's our um, uh, clinical trial network. So that's an investment that primarily is driven by the government sector. But you also do need to bring in the private, but they will come in a little later on. You know, once you've done some part of the uh, risk has been mitigated, then they come forward. But it clearly has to be a consortium approach because each one has to be part of that consortium. And many a times it's like a relay race, you know, each one does their bit and then hands over the baton to the next, but everyone's got the end point. They know what the finishing line is. So everyone's running for it and each one has to do their bit. You can't just slow down because you're only meeting your part of that relay. Unless you reach the end, no one is a winner. So in this, everyone has to be a winner if you to take it to the finishing line. So I think that's how we have to take it forward. Thank you. Those, uh, both of you, those are very wise words. And I think this is also the perfect segue to get the representative from the industry. We have uh, Mr. Satish Reddy, who's the chairman of Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, and he has led the organization's transition from a unifocused manufacturer of APIs to a company that's moved up the value chain uh, with a diverse product uh, portfolio of finished dosage formulations. Um, 
Mr. Satish Reddy, over to you, and we look forward to hearing your comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anjali, uh, for the very uh, kind words of introduction, uh, I must say. Uh, warm hello to all uh, the distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Bhargava, Dr. Renu Swaroop, uh, Dr. Sumani, uh, you know, so several others uh, distinguished panelists who are on today's call. So I'll just pay, make it just a few uh, uh, remarks, uh, you know, but coming from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, more to give a context of, you know, it's like what, what is our thinking and in terms of, you know, it's like what could be, uh, you know, certain challenges that we face and, you know, it's like what could be done to overcome them, maybe just some kind of a, uh, recommendations very briefly. Um, again, you know, the, 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 the whole effort uh, that's being done, uh, you know, by the DNDI is, is extremely commendable uh, that, you know, in its 15 years of existence, already that, uh, you know, close to nine treatments have been developed and in the next eight years in the strategic plan, you know, another 15 to 18 uh, are uh, being developed. Uh, this, this is something quite a commendable effort because this whole, uh, you know, neglected diseases, you know, they, 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 they give a significant, they place a significant burden, you know, especially on developing uh, economies. And this is not something that affects just uh, low income and, uh, you know, middle income countries, but uh, we also see, see it appearing, for example, in the United States, uh, they also dis disproportionately, uh, you know, the, obviously affect uh, the poor. And, uh, you know, it, 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 in fact, uh, uh, Peter Hotez, uh, you know, of the Sabine Vaccine Institute and uh, the Baylor College of Medicine, he estimated that almost uh, half of the 20 million people living in poverty in the U.S. are infected with at least one of these, uh, you know, entities. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's quite a telling uh, number in terms of where it is. And especially if you see the interventions that we see in the neglected diseases, they represent some of the largest public health, uh, uh, you know, interventions globally. And uh, from, from the biopharmaceutical industry, you know, which, which carries a lot of innovation, it's been a very active partner uh, uh, throughout, and uh, especially the London Declaration, it uh, brought together this this uh, innovative biopharmaceutical industry with also multi-sector partners, you know, to advance the R&D, to uh, eradicate, uh, to eliminate, or to even control, you know, 10 neglected uh, diseases by 2020. Uh, also, also a pledge to donate 14 billion treatments, you know, from the industry, uh, you know, over 10 years. And uh, also about 80 diverse partners were committed to the declaration, DNDI, of course, being uh, one of them. And in the last eight years, pharmaceutical companies have donated over 120 billion treatments and more than 1 billion people were treated for at least one of the WHO's uh, 20 prioritized, uh, uh, you know, neglected uh, diseases. Uh, also, I would like to say that our company, Dr. Redis, has been at the forefront of uh, the support. Uh, to eliminate the neglected uh, uh, diseases. And just to talk about some of them, uh, we have collaborated uh, with uh, TB Alliance, with uh, DNDI, with uh, GARDP, with MSF, and we uh, continue to work with uh, UNICEF, UNITAID, uh, BMGF, you know, just to name a few. And uh, we work closely, uh, you know, for various areas, for whether it's for ideation, whether it's assessment of uh, market viability, whether it's uh, API formulation development, manufacturing, also registration in low and middle income countries and also commercialization. That's that's the areas where we uh, work on. And uh, in fact, our company had uh, signed, uh, you know, in fact, our discovery arm origin, Dr. Redis and uh, our discovery arm. And we have signed an MOU to explore joint opportunities, for example, to make uh, zoliflodacin, which is a new treatment for gonorrhea, to make it accessible in low and middle income countries, including South Africa, Thailand, and uh, India. Uh, just to conclude just a couple of points, uh, in terms of major focus areas, uh, I would say, especially for uh, addressing the neglected diseases, number one, I would say is about the clinical trials. I think there's, there's a, definitely a need to improve the clinical trial uh, ecosystem in India, especially with regard to hospitals and also augmenting the quality, the capabilities of the facility, personnel, personnel uh, regulatory clearances. You know, all these are areas certainly to be uh, looked at and I'm, I'm uh, uh, quite happy that the government is doing a lot of work in this regard. And uh, these are particularly relevant to uh, neglected uh, diseases, given that the disease burden is much higher in India compared to other countries. And also, if you see in terms of numbers, India has about 17% of the global population and 20% of the global disease burden. But if you see the global clinical trials done in India, it's less than 1.4%. That itself is quite telling in terms of where we stand. So that's, that's number one clinical trials. Uh, for a focus area. The second one is early stage drug discovery. Uh, Dr. Balram Bhargav also talked about, you know, the, the, how risky this is in terms of, uh, you know, pursuing it as a business. Uh, but what's also heartening is that, you know, early stage research in 
especially academia as well as research uh, institutions that are supported by government funding agencies, these become a key uh, driver uh, to discovery of novel pathways uh, you know, that can target neglected diseases. And uh, one suggestion would be also that you know, if the compound collections, uh, you know, especially by you know, large um, uh, multinationals, uh, you know, to which if they can contribute this to academic collaborators, you know, that that can be a play a key role in uh, screening of the potential uh, uh, hits. You know, also some of the institutions uh, that we have supported, uh, Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Sciences, for example, it's been en engaging in uh, uh, TB drug discovery and uh, rare disease uh, uh, research programs with also support from DBT as well as with uh, ICMR. Also, the third uh, focus area is the drugs repurposing. I think it it, it, it was pretty much shown uh, during the global response of uh, you know the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, which uh, you know uh, as Dr. Bhargava talked about, uh, you know especially in advances of uh, new vaccines, uh, also in terms of treatments, uh, you know at unprecedented uh, speed, absolutely in terms of shortening the clinical development and uh, our regulatory timelines. We also seen that in India, thanks to uh, you know the drug uh, regulator Dr. Sumanji, you know several good things have happened. Uh, you know, in terms of drugs repurposing, for example, we've been part of Remdesivir uh, uh, in, co in collaboration with Gilead, uh, Favipiravir in agreement with, uh, you know, the Fuji film, 2DG, uh, you know, with a uh, Indian uh, uh, public sector institution, DRDO, uh, you know, several, several things uh, that have happened there. So just to conclude, my specific recommendations would be, uh, you know, especially, you know, to uh, look at the regulatory aspects uh, of different countries as, uh, you know, these different the processes negatively impacts, uh, you know, especially ability of pharma companies like us to pursue this neglected uh, disease focused drug launches, because if there's a clear, coherent understanding and also implementation of a common regulatory approval, you know, the, the, for example, a single approval for Africa, uh, you know, or for South America, I mean, it could boost the chances of most, uh, uh, you know, pharma companies to engage in these drugs for uh, neglected diseases. So regulatory is one recommendation. Uh, second one, uh, especially, I just talked about this, that increased access and availability of these uh, preclinical models and uh, clinical study uh, the, the pathways which can mitigate the risk of research and investment for uh, pharmaceutical organizations. And lastly, I would say that, you know, funding, especially from uh, philanthropic agencies, uh, foundations, uh, you know, global funds, uh, you know, which can uh, support, uh, extend the support uh, through DNDI, uh, like TB Alliance, for, for example, it can channelize, you know, it can help channelize the scope for early stage uh, research uh, uh, product projects and uh, development. You know, just, just this few thoughts I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think um, one of the things we did have a roundtable discussion with some ASEAN representatives, and one of the things they did come up with was exactly what you say is about common minimum standards, as well as looking at, uh, you know, some harmonization between even international or national uh, academia and industry. And I think we will come back to you with some questions on that. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, I would really like to uh, uh, invite Dr. Tamid Ahmed to speak um, uh, a little bit about uh, what um, mechanisms can be used to promote South-South collaboration as he puts his points forward. Also, Dr. Tamid uh, Ahmed, it's a privilege to introduce you because from the beginning of my public uh, health career, we've been hearing about the wonderful work of ICDDRB. So over to you. Thank you, Ms. Mayer, uh, Professor Gupta, Professor Vargab, Dr. Swarup, uh, Dr. Reddy, Executive Director, Dr. Kavita Singh, and distinguished audience, good afternoon. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you, to meet this august and distinguished audience. <clears throat> And this morning, I was going through the STRAT plan that was shared by Dr. Singh. And I must tell you what a wonderful document it is. And I would also like to join Professor Vargab in congratulating DNDI for the wonderful strategic plan that you have prepared. It may be in the draft stage, you know, but when I was going through it, all the essential elements are there. So thank you and congratulations. One important element that I found was, you know, the three pillars of DNDI mission. And these are very important for the work that we are doing in Bangladesh. One is innovation, very important. Second is you have 
you know, fostering of sustainable solutions. And then finally, advocacy for change. If you don't do that, and if you don't do that effectively, nothing is going to take place. And perhaps these are some of the things that Bangladesh uh, may have done a little bit better. And that's why we see some of the changes now, you know, the positive changes. But let me tell you a little bit about the place that I come from, ICDDRB. And as Ms. Nair has mentioned, perhaps we are best known <clears throat> for the huge amount of research that was done in the 1960s and the 70s that led to the development of oral rehydration salt solution, ORS. And today we have a remedy that has been estimated to have saved 70 million lives. So such a very important remedy, again, coming from this uh, subcontinent uh, where we live and work. And I think DNDI has the capability of coming across some more treatments that can eventually change the climate uh, of uh, working with the NTDs. I was asked to talk about collaboration and how, you know, in particular, we have been able to work in, you know, reducing the burden of visceral leishmaniasis. At ICDDRB, in addition to enterics, we are now working a lot on vaccines, on molecular biology, on tuberculosis, even, you know, social uh, issues. So anything that is a problem to people living in low and middle income countries, that we think is also a mandate for us to work on. So therefore, a couple of decades ago, we thought that yes, visceral leishmaniasis is a very important area. And we have a dedicated team led by my, led by my dear colleague, who many of you know, Dr. Dinesh Mandal, who works on, you know, VL, you know, his life work. And, you know, one thing that is important for the ministries in Bangladesh, ministries that take care of our health, is that they, they want evidence that's home generated. As a scientist, as a researcher, I would be happy to work on evidence that has been generated elsewhere. But, you know, when you go and talk with the people in the ministry, they will say that, well, if that has worked in Africa, are you sure that that's going to work in Bangladesh too? And I think they are, they are correct in what they say. And that's one of the reasons why my colleagues, they keep on generating homegrown evidence in the best possible way. And then they, you know, make it uh, possible for this to be disseminated to the policymakers. And one important thing that they do is to work very closely with people in the government, the policymakers, the programmers, the people who actually run the program for eliminating, for controlling these diseases. And this is very important. And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, certain illnesses, we are seeing a rapid decline one of them certainly is visceral leishmaniasis. And as I talk to you, Bangladesh has already achieved the target for elimination, which is one case in 10,000 people living at the grassroots level. And I think that has been possible because of the, you know, insight of the government of Bangladesh and also the work done by researchers such as Dr. Dinesh Mondal and his team. So, uh, as I said that, you know, we still, we have a lot to do. There are other NTDs. Today, as I talk to you, uh, we are fortunate that, you know, I am alive and COVID-19, the national, you know, infection rate has gone down below 2%. Such a wonderful, you know, news. Even two or three months ago, it was 30% plus. And now it has gone down to less than 2%. But if you go to any hospital in Dhaka city, you will see that the hospitals are full to the brim with patients with dengue. So dengue is still a problem, huge problem. And I was so happy to see uh, uh, 
in this strategic plan of DNDI that dengue is one of the diseases you know, that features very well on this strat plan. So the uh, neglected tropical diseases audience, these are a disease of this part of the world. And I say this part of the world because of the sheer population size that we share, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Afghanistan. If we don't think about these diseases, if we don't work on the elimination of these diseases, who else will? So with these few words, I would like to thank you once again, and in particular, Dr. Kavita Singh, for asking me to join this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. I mean, we will come back uh, with some questions. I know I can see a lot of questions in the chat, but I would like to introduce Dr. Farhat Mantu, Director General, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, India. Her primary research interests are in the application and relevance of low quality medical innovations and implementation for them in humanitarian medicine. And I think we will come up come to a very, very important topic about treatment and the treatment access challenges for NTDs and what can the public leadership do to connect efforts in innovation and access. Uh, so Dr. Mantu, over to you, please. Thank you, Anjali. And uh, what a rich conversation. And I'm, I hope that I'm able to add something to this rich conversation. Uh, as uh, one of the founding members of the NDI and uh, an organization that is today 50 years old, uh, I would very briefly like to introduce who we are. We are a medical humanitarian organization that is working around the globe. And if we work with populations that have challenges with access to healthcare, are the most vulnerable, are excluded either politically, socially, economically from the healthcare systems. So in such environment, we are talking about in our experiences, what we see. So I'm going to talk about the first aspect. Now I'm going to touch three or four aspects uh, to keep it short so that we have an opportunity to have some exchange after this. The first one is that we, in our field experiences in the projects around the world, we say people are neglected, not diseases. And now we are talking about NTDs. So that would demonstrate the extent of neglect we are talking about. It's a, it's a kind of something that is, everybody of us are fully aware of it. We are talking about more than 1.7 billion people affected, hundreds and thousands dying every year. And still NTDs are not part of public discourse. What COVID taught us, COVID taught us it is possible globally to pay attention to be if there is political will, if there is resource investment, and if there is awareness, then we can really progress at a very, very fast pace. So the first one I would say that that let's learn out of the ongoing COVID experiences, the global leadership, the leadership that was demonstrated in South Asia, the leadership that was demonstrated in the country itself, if we look at uh, our policy regulatory environment, how that in times of this pandemic actually became an enabler in itself. So there is very much possibility of us collectively looking at a more comprehensive policy with very clear roadmaps, more political will, but more than political will equal funding possibilities and also ex clear action plans. Uh, going back and looking at the WHO roadmap, the second roadmap that came out on NTDs 21, 21, 2021 to 2020 to 2030. And, and we all are fully aware that where are we heading, that a lot of uh, it is not uh, in terms of costing, it's not completely yet costed, but we already are apprehensive that uh, because somewhere these neglected tropical diseases are going to further slide down and uh, get out of the attention and the prioritization that is very much the need of the hour. Um, Dr. Bargava spoke about something, but I would really like to put the attention back to this. 
uh, we, uh, he spoke about post-elimination. So we do have examples, not only uh, from the region, but also from globe. Let's take the example of Kalazar or sleeping sickness. So once we reach that elimination stage, from a very patient perspective, I'm looking at how do we make sure that the awareness continues, the expertise stays there, the surveillance continues, advocacy around these topics happen so that we make sure they're mainstreamed and not forgotten again, so that they go back and fall in the NTD category again in future. Um, the list that was uh, defined by WHO, uh, because I'm, I'm not only going to focus on South Asia, I'm going to talk about some of the diseases that we encounter in the field that are prominent to mention, because they will give us an idea about if we are leaving them halfway through, they are going to come back to us. A classic example is Noma. It's a deadly bacterial uh, disease we are talking about, which if we look at historically, it used to occur widely in Europe, but disappeared as the living conditions and access to healthcare improved. Today, it's prevalent mainly in Africa, if we talk about from Senegal to Ethiopia. But we also know that there are cases that are coming up. We are hearing through our projects that there are cases in Asia and more recently in Europe and United States in patients with poor immune system. So this Noma disease did not make up to the priority list of WHO NTD list. So through this medium, I also want to see how we collectively not only focus on the diseases that are in the region that are neglected, but the diseases that are uh, concerning a certain part of the world could be a reality for us tomorrow. So that awareness around that is quite crucial to talk about. Then we did talk about quite a bit that uh, when we talk about NTDs, we are talking about the most vulnerable. We call them diseases of the poor, which are not attractive for uh, commercial pharma companies in terms of investment. So we not only are talking about funding in R&D and so, but we are also talking about looking at the financial barriers these patients have in access to healthcare. And not only that, because these diseases occur in certain geographical locations and impact certain populations. So that would mean that in terms of supply, a major challenge to access is that the supply sometimes and the demand around it is so small that it is not sufficient enough to negotiate some elements of pool procurement or, 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 or things that that would really help make sure that even if there is development, even if there is medicine available, but is the access to medicine possible or not? So we also have to collectively look at how do we create that ecosystem that is there. Another aspect which I feel is uh, this is uh, our experiences, uh, which is we live in a very fertile ecosystem. And our uh, distinguished colleagues uh, spoke about the innovation, the transformation that we are talking about, low cost, high quality innovations that we see. What is one area where we have to pay a bit more attention is about more uh, adoption of national innovation. Many a times we see innovation from this part of the world being adopted faster in the global north than in the global south itself. And uh, the last bit of it, which I would really like to look at is uh, how do we make sure that the entities stay as a priority in the national discourse. We did see that uh, our media played a massive role. Our academia played a massive role in, in raising the awareness, but that would also mean that, that with that awareness also came a lot of misinformation around various diseases. So uh, what we could also look at as, as an area uh, is, is to see how we make sure that the right information flow is there, but the people power that we experienced in making science approachable, accessible, and uh, is, is, is something that, that we have to see how do we collectively bring the spotlight on. Uh, so th these are some of the uh, basic thoughts, I would say, uh, that uh, we have. And, and I'm glad to see that uh, through these initiatives, we hope to get everyone from policy, 
uh, to people who are looking in the commercial aspect of it, in the academia, in the regulatory framework, all of us together. And DNDI, uh, thank you for facilitating this platform because these are the conversations we need to have, uh, not only to be a, looking at these diseases in India, in South Asia, but also how do we act as global leaders in the area of neglected tropical diseases. Thank you. Over to you, Anjali. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mantu. Really appreciate your comments. And we come now to the last speaker, but definitely not the least, uh, Dr. Harish Ayer, who is the Deputy Director, uh, Digital Health and Innovations at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Harish has also been uh, the strategic planner and brains behind some of the partnerships that have uh, happened between uh, governments and uh, other uh, funding agencies, including global partners uh, in critical R&D work for vaccine preventable diseases, new approaches to treating neglected diseases, and life science partnerships for public health, digital health, and digital delivery. Harish, really looking forward to hearing from you. And post that, I think we will have time for two to three questions, um, which we will ask the speakers. Thank you so much, Anjali and Kavita, for inviting me to this uh, excellent panel. I've been given the rather difficult job of talking about innovative financing, so I'll try and do my best and try and focus on the topic. Uh, as we all know, uh, NTDs, as many speakers have said already, have unfortunately been a major social and market failure because obviously the disease impacts human beings uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. So in this context, special congrats to DNDI on coming on focusing on this problem in the very title of their organization and coming out of the eight year strategic plan where you know when I hear Dr. Bargav say 25 drugs in 25 years, that's really astonishing. However, we must admit that this is a difficult challenge in general, right? Uh, even with COVID, where while vaccines worked, there was a significant economic pie at stake. It seems like vaccines worked, much more challenging to get drugs and biologics that work safely and effectively. The world has simply not had much success with repurposed drugs, and we must be honest about it. So we have to start by being humble in this challenging problem but we do need a clear understanding of where we need to go. Uh, part of it is set up very clear criteria. And I think DNDI leads the way on some of this along with WHO and other organizations. Uh, what is the end point here? What is the target pro pro profile of what we want to achieve? In terms of financing, uh, uh, my thoughts are the following. Uh, I think the financing to strengthen the country's uh, scientific and clinical ecosystem with MDs, MD, PhDs coming in, uh, and uh, interdisciplinary cross-cutting teams, clinical pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, modeling. I think all that generally has been financed by the governments of the day, because they're very clear that this is a you know more broad beyond just NTDs. It's for many, many diseases. The foundation itself has worked and contributed significantly to public-private product development partnerships. And these have been often uh, works between uh, philanthropies, Pharma companies, as Dr. Gupta said in the very beginning, I think Dr. Kavitha also mentioned this, pharma companies and governments, because let's face it, pharma companies have a lot of molecules in their pipeline that they don't, uh, don't want to, that they've tested, that already have some properties. Could we make them, you know, could we ask them to tap into it? On, the, on this front, uh, specifically, I wanted to call out uh, GHIT, and the right fund, this is the, these are two collaborations that the foundation has done. G8 with the Japanese government. So Japanese government puts money into it. Foundation puts money into it. And the pharma companies, many of the Japanese pharma companies put money into it or put molecules into it, put assays into it. So we can take things forward in, in either malaria or TB or NTDs, right? Very clear, very clear goals. Important to in any such group partnership we put together, one can imagine Indian government coming together with perhaps a philanthropy with pharma companies saying, hey, put these things into this thing uh, and have very clear contracts while you're working on such a partnership. What is expected of each side in this kind of a equation? Uh, I think equally, uh, and so this is primarily what I would call pull funding, uh, uh, push funding. The other kinds of push funding would be, of course, taxpayer funded research in mission mode. 
And we've heard from ICMR, DBT, CSIR, other key players in the Indian ecosystem. I am part of uh, one such system, which I worked on with Kavita earlier, Mission COVID Suraksha, in terms of you know vaccine development. I think it was a, it is, and it was a tremendous success. And I think uh, you know showing that you can, with fairly reasonable sums of money, uh, you know pull and help the ecosystem to move forward. Uh, I think also noting that, uh, you know, part of this also is the public research that, uh, you know, Dr. Bhargava talked about, particularly for the inactivated whole virion vaccine. I think it's important to note here that often in the diseases we are talking about, government is the buyer of the ultimate output of research. So there is a lot of power here and a lot of possibility of government to signal to industry. I think uh, Dr. Mantu talked about this as well in terms of pro pooled procurements. Equally, I think uh, global pool funding uh, has had big, big impact. Uh, you know, I would be remiss if I did not talk about Gavi or Global Fund as key signalers globally. Uh, they can, they have their own role to play globally. Obviously, uh, fully recognizing that, you know, this creates tensions between countries globally, what do we want to do? But certainly these pools of money contribute to the fact that there can be funding available even if you get to a success point of view. Uh, one, other, one, a couple of other innovations I want to talk about. One, from a regulatory perspective, uh, you know, in my past uh, few years, also explored what are called priority review vouchers. In the US, uh, these are for diseases of national priority for neglected diseases often, or tropical diseases, right? Because normally they would, net, I mean, pharma companies, Rightly or wrongfully, that investors expect you to work on diabetes, oncology, uh, you know, the hypertension, the kinds of diseases that most middle class and upper class folks kind of have. Lower class people also have it, but obviously th those are much more, you know, chronic, much more predictable, fairly easy understood endpoints. Malaria is a much more difficult endpoint to make. TB is a much more difficult endpoint to make. Um, although I think in the like, NTDs. We've had uh, you know, some success with amphotericin B and things like that. So how do we convince companies that there is some benefit if you, you know, participate in such partnerships, you may get some benefits. I mean, this is an experiment the US government uh, has tried and we'd have to assess how well that worked. Is there something for us to learn over there? Uh, what about, and I'm gonna throw out, because innovative financing was the topic, I'm gonna throw out another idea, social impact bonds. Could we think, I mean, we have had uh, rural electrification bonds. We've had many types of bonds in the country. Should we do things like this for health, right? Should we have in general, I mean, I could have imagined that there could be a vaccine bond, for example, to buy COVID vaccines, but you could have had, you could have similar things like this. And what is the, and, and finally the point about what is the investment case around it, right? If, if, private people have a lot of money in their hands, how do you get them to spend money on things like this rather than something that is not so socially useful, right? How do we make them think through this problem? How do we make sure government can pull these uh, kind of investments into things that are socially useful? What's the investment case, uh, case, the improvement in health, the reduction in suffering, morbidity, mortality, and of course, ultimately the economic case uh, for why this financing is very important. I would not, I don't want to necessarily talk about the moral and ethical case to do this, but obviously that is extremely important. But since we're talking about financing, you know, people do their models and want to understand, hey, how did my model turn out in this case? So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harish. I think you've addressed uh, quite a few of the follow-up questions that I had. So really appreciate this. I believe we have Fortunate to have uh, Dr. Viji Somani join us. Uh, Dr. Viji Somani is the Drugs Controller General of India, and he has made time to come back after his very important meeting. So thank you, sir. Um, over to you, Dr. Somani, for your remarks. Thank you, uh, Anjali ji, and thank you, uh, Dr. YKG, as called, uh, you know, with uh, love and affection. Dr. Y.K. Gupta, and talk, thank you, Dr. Kavita Singh, and uh, entire BNDI team for giving this opportunity. And uh, certainly, you know, as I, I could hear some of the part uh, when you uh, were beginning your talk, and Professor Balram Bhargav, and uh, some part of uh, Renuswaru, uh, Madam, 
certainly this neglected tropical diseases or neglected diseases they are neglected because of the certain as everybody has told neglected commercial reasons and uh, despite the fact that it requires a lot of attention innovation the tropical in the tropical part the industry for the innovation is very little and it is mostly encouraged to do the work for making the drugs available for the masses rather than for classes so they are more interested in the generic drugs than the complex uh, finding out this so in addition to having public private partnership various financing solutions bringing all people together making the line listing of what are this neglected diseases and not only neglected which are neglected tropical diseases which actually affect the masses and finally the world and in that regulator also becomes a, a important player during the entire development life cycle of the drug the regulator has to provide a complete hand holding just like somebody has earlier to me harish has told that there has to be regulatory involvement not through the regulatory voucher and all such kind of thing which means the the guidance and the hand holding from the beginning stages and expeditious rolling reviews and approvals all these things becomes very important and while devising our new drugs and clinical trial rules which were just released 2 years back all these things are taken into consideration wherein the concept of deemed approval if you don't hear anything within 30 days for the inds the concept of pre submission meeting not only concept of pre submission meeting for all these things but post submission meeting which are paid meetings and also irrespect even even if these are put into the rules there are also other channels open through the public relation office of the cdsco in the headquarter and at the zonal and subzonal and the port offices in the drug discovery it is not only that you find out the drug and you find out the assays and uh, you try to see something in vitro and something in vivo a lot of things are involved that you have to transfer the material from one country to other country transfer the technology also at the customs during the transport you need every time some kind of permission hand holding or exemption so all these things are made possible secondly the designs of the clinical trials the preclinical studies how how much it can be how much risk can be how much risk can be you know attended during the physical chemical and clinical preclinical studies and how much the clinical studies population can be reduced all these things are possible in this regulatory provisions which are given into the new drugs and clinical trial rules and that gives a better platform for the development of the drugs or the medicines or the devices or sometimes the even the immuno uh, immuno biologicals and the diagnostics all these provisions are there and we would like to work hand in hand with organizations like uh, dndi and also we are working with various other regulatory agencies because my experience as a while working in the world health organization india is participating there as a one of the chair uh, i am the chair of member state mechanism for last 3 years and where regulators from all 195 countries do come and discuss on such issues including other issues also but this remains also a very important issue so best practices whatever we can learn we can very well adopt into our regulatory system which will and some of this example uh, dr kavita and dr uh, yk ji are also evidence uh, means uh, witness that that how during the development of covid-19 vaccines 
not only development, it's tech transfer, it's up, upscaling, how we have utilized these principles and how we have come up to the expectations of this pandemic preparedness so that we can not only produce for our country, but are able to give to other countries and reach to the mark of almost 1 billion vaccine doses being given to our Indian population. So regulatory involvement since the beginning with the any kind of ideation or any kind of idea which is being generated in the field of the diagnostics or therapeutics in the for the neglected diseases or neglected tropical diseases is inherently given into our regulation and what best can be adopted the government always remains open for that because this is a priority for all the programs in our country be it malaria be it uh, filariasis or be it anything so we thank you dndi for taking this uh, wonderful uh, program and bringing everybody on the platform and we assure you that our cooperation we will be more than willing to get uh, more inputs from you and our cooperation will always be there thank you very much thank you so much dr sumani i think everyone is here today because we do know there is a better way we know that there is also a faster way to turn the progress to success and we are all committed to it i would like to invite dr kavita singh to just sum up this very rich discussion and we really look forward to the report from dndi thank you so much dr kavita singh i i actually have no words to thank each member you know considering the time and everybody is spare time professor bhargava is still there so it's my privilege uh, actually I, I don't think i can really sum up anjali it's impossible we do have lots of questions for each uh, each speaker so i'm going to request my uh, team here that please let's collate and if we can get answers from the speakers experts it would really and put them together at one place along with this uh, seminar when it gets projected or it gets posted it will be an excellent uh, feedback uh, and it's my privilege to thank each uh, member and it's so heartening once again to see the support we have got for this uh, for this platform of neglected tropical diseases and neglected patients both we certainly cannot uh, you know dissect them uh, thank you all for your insight your advice your suggestions uh, your commitment to be uh, to support us um, i thank dr bhargava dr surup dr samani thank all of you I uh, thank our Bangladesh colleagues. I uh, thank Harish for his uh, very innovative uh, ideas. We'll really want to work with some of them. Dr. Mantu, thank you so much. Uh, your points were totally, uh, I believe, ground reality. So thank you for sharing. And also thank you, Anjali, for moderating the session so beautifully. Thanks a ton. And thank our global IT team, our global communications, and last but not the least, our Delhi office uh, team for uh, helping us put this get all the experts together in one place and hopefully we'll connect again soon. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, everyone. Thank you, Thank audience. You everyone. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.